Hi and welcome to Talk with Tyson. And on Talk with Tyson, I'm here, Matthew Almeida. Dear friends, the topic of Goa Inquisition is so sensitive, so controversial sometimes, that in our country it is sometimes overhyped. And therefore, this is a topic that requires a lot of deep research. Well, there are a lot of people who have dedicated their lives and their whole career in studying this particular topic and getting, trying to get all the aspects of this called the Goa Inquisition. Today we have with us a wonderful person, a genius, a researcher in this particular topic. May I welcome Susanna. Susanna, her full name is Susanna Bastos Matthews, correct? So both of us have something in common. Uh, she has a name called Matthews, which also means my name as Matthew in Portuguese. Am I right? Yes. Yes, yes very much. So here we are, Susanna, on Talk with Tyson, and you are having a talk with Matthew on Talk with Tyson. So let me introduce to my audiences who Susanna is and what is she doing. Right now she's in Goa. They recently released a book called The Trial of Katharina the Orta by the Goa Inquisition. And she's the co-author of this book. Uh, Susanna is a researcher of the Alberto Beniste Chair of Shepherdic Studies at the University of Lisbon. She is a member of the international research group called the History of the Inquisition and of the editorial board of the journal Cadernos de Estudos Sefarditas. She is a co-author of the book called Trial of Catarina de Orta by the Goa Inquisition with Miguel Rodriguez Lorenzo and Carla Vieira. Presently, she is coordinating the project Praying to God of Israel, according to the Portuguese tradition from the 16th to the 18th centuries, which is dedicated to studying the circulation of clandestine prayer books in the Iberian world during the early modern period. Her principal research field focuses on the dynamics of the shepherdic diaspora of the 16th century, the role of women and questioning the importance of gender as an element of research and agency. Wow, that's a lot, uh, Susanna, and I think this is a huge success for you that you have achieved so much and you are still going on contributing to the society, especially what is important for both the countries, Portugal, and India. So in all this success, did you ever imagine in your life that you'll sit down with me and do this interview? Hi, Matthew. Thank you for inviting me. No, I wasn't expecting this, but it's, well, uh, I thank you a lot for your interest in on the topic we res are doing research. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. It, it in fact, you know, because I asked you that question because I saw you uh, doing an interview with Dale, Dale Luis Menezes, and I said, I want to interview these people because they are giving an in-depth study of this topic, which is very dear to me as well. I have a passion in that and I want to study more. So it's a great honor for me sitting with you and doing this interview. So shall we go ahead with the questions? Yeah. So the first question that comes when we consider this book, The Trial of Katharina the Orta by the Goa Inquisition. Now, Katharina the Orta is a woman and therefore, the question that comes to my mind is, how did the Inquisition treat women? Did they use different standards in their treatment and dealings with women? Uh, like, you know, what was the criteria they followed? Or was it like just okay with them? So it's a very interesting question. Uh, and to me, it's my major uh, uh, inquire, my major question in my research. Um, I will say that for start, the Inquisition uses the same procedure for men and women, of course. Okay. The same general rules, same general procedure. But we should bear in mind that women in medieval times, in early modern times, were considered dangerous. Sometimes even today <laughs> they are, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately. And in those times, they considered that women had um, perhaps a discreet uh, role in what we call today public sphere, but a huge importance in private and domestic spheres. So when we are addressing questions of clandestine or subver subversive 
religiosities, women gain a lot of protagonism in the house, inside their homes. So um, then the Inquisition are interesting to understand what took place inside the houses, inside these domestic realms. And they were more harsh on women in order to try to get the confessions and the descriptions of what was happening outside the eyes of society, outside the eyes of the neighborhood. So we should think that, yes, at the end, there was a different treatment regarding women. And also we have to bear in mind that the whole structure of the Inquisition, so the whole institution was built by men. Mm. The inquisitors were men, the judges were men, the priests were men. So yes, there's an unbalanced relation in all of this. Of course. Anyway. So what did you find so peculiar in the case of Catarina the Orta, because of which uh, she was tried under the Inquisition and she had to face the judgment that she faced because she was put to burning at stake by the secular authorities. So what are those peculiarities in her case that, like, you know, took her to this extent? Okay, Caterina di Orta was um, a new Christian. So she was born into a family of ancient Jews that were first converted to Christianity in, at the end of the 15th century okay. in Castile and Portugal. And as a new Christian, she was suspected to preserve some uh, practices, some aspects of her previous religious, religion, Judaism. And she was accused of maintaining some Jewish practices. And as she was a Christian, she was baptized. She incurred on the crime of apostasy. And so that's the trigger of her trial in general terms. Okay. She was accused of Jewish practices, of maintaining, of sustaining the ancient faith of the Jews. But the specificity of this case is that she is accused of something that today we consider as a very um, unimportant uh, thing, so, such as cooking some kind of meals, uh, not eating pork, or uh, fasting some days, using cleaning shirts church, uh, on Saturdays, for instance, so very, very to our eyes, the eyes of today, they are very unimportant things. But to the Inquisition, these were signs of the sustaining of Judaism inside their ho her house, her family. So it was a crime. That's what uh, triggers her trial. Ultimately, the, the harshness of her sentence has to do more with the inquisitorial procedure that we can maybe address in some other questions. Yeah, in yeah. So uh, I was going through your book and I found that you mentioned that certain gossips here and there, that is what led for complaints against Katarina di Orta. So can you just give us some instances what happened? Yes, what happened is that uh, one person could go to the Inquisition because she was feeling that something wasn't right with Caterina. She was talking to Caterina on the street, on the market, or outside the house, for instance, and she heard something. And she considered that this wasn't accordingly to Christianity. For instance, that maybe Jesus was not the Messiah. Oh. <laughs> or so. She went to the inquisitors, this denouncer, as we called in specific legal terms, and she will confess this. Then another one could say that she was uh, eating dinner with Katarina and Katarina didn't eat pork. pork. And this is suspicious. This raises suspicions. And so they went to the inquisition and they and the inquisition started to inquire. To investigate, to investigate and to create an accusation that was uh, formalized against Katerina. This is the kind of things. That actually, most of the times what we have 
in the denunciations, in the accusations, are very daily life things, very simple things. And that are those simple things that ultimately uh, produce a condemnation to those who were tried. So like simple things, and I think this is the reason why, going back to the context of those days, the monarchs, the imperial governments, they impose certain compulsory leave, food habits and so on. So if you eat that food, that means you are a Christian, otherwise you are not. So not there. Going to the next question, if you look at the whole trial of Katarina, the order, how would you categorize, how would you like, you know, divide it into various levels or stages, how it like, you know, aggregated to and progressed as a trial and finally the judgment that was passed on her? Huh? So, uh, inquisitorial trial have a standard formula and one of Katerina respects th that formula. So, this, uh, we have these accusations that arrive at the tribunal uh, for different reasons. Well, And then uh, the inquisitors start to creating the trial itself. They will order the arrest of Katerina after they receive these accusations then the prosecutor will produce a formal accusation. Then we have the different hearings, no? the different interrogations. That is a very important part of the trial because it's where the defendant, in this case Katerina, stands alone in front of the inquisitors. So this is the key, one of the key moments of the trial. After she received the accusations, uh, or the general accusations, because the inquisitorial trial is has some aspects that are secret. So she didn't know the name of the accusers, she didn't know exactly what the accusations were. Cool. This is the standard of the inquisitorial procedure. But she received some kind of approximate uh, accusations. So she must confess, and confess something that match the accusations. This is very important. So the inquisitors will think that she is a true confessor. She is not um, secretly uh, put something, some guilt aside or she is not uh, lying to the inquisition. Mm -hmm. After this, she can present some defense. The defense, they will uh, call some witnesses to uh, sustain her claims. And at the end, the, the board of the Inquisition will uh, decide on her. And in this case, they decide that she is not a true, con she is not confessing entirely. She is diminishing the confession and she must be uh, burned at stake. Okay, so the moments where the Inquisitors felt that she is not confessing or totally, so that rose a suspicion into the minds of the Inquisitors that probably she is truly going against the Christian teachings and practicing Judaism as she was accused of. Okay. Did you find in her case, when you were reading through the cases, the whole trial and everything, did you find a moment where Katharina could save herself and do something by which she could be free from this trial? No. Um, Katerina, we have to bear in mind the inquisitorial reality, the inquisitorial rules, not our own oh, <laughs> yeah. today. You know? And in this case, she had um, some accusations that were built against her. The accusations were strong in inquisitorial terms uh, regarding crimes of Judaism. And she confessed part of the, the accusations. So she, maybe, I think what could happen differently in their trial is if she maintained a very strong confession and very coherent confession all over the trial, she could eventually be uh, con con sentenced to a minor uh, sentence in a way. Okay. The, what happened is she contradicted herself a lot during the trial. She went back and forth with confessions. She eventually confessed in one hearing something, and then in the next hearing she will deny the, conf the previous confession. Um, and in this case, this incoherence made 
the inquisitors considered that she was not a true, uh, she was not true. Uh, pen, exactly true in her confessions. Mm -hmm. And this, this case uh, ultimately produced a more harsh, a more serious condemnation, the condemnation to, to death. Okay, so it's, it's unimaginable, like, you know, from today's world view that somebody would be persecuted for their belief, so to say, or something that doesn't go in agreement with somebody's belief system. Uh, it's, but it is a reality that in history, people have been killed, there have been wars in the name of religion or religious beliefs, or not following the tenets of so and so. What lessons can we draw from events like the Inquisition, be it Goa Inquisition or any other, for our time today? Because when we are studying the past, we are studying it with a purpose. What lessons can we draw from the Inquisition? It's a very complicated question and also I don't have a exact answer. What I would say today, and you are totally right, we are asking questions from our today's uh, in, in, um, uncertainties, view, no? yeah. today's views. And what I will say is maybe two things. First, we have to understand the complexities of history. We cannot go and analyze such a reality with a very dichotomic or a very simplistic view. This is very dangerous because then we produce narratives that are single narratives yes. and not correspond to the, you know, the specificities of women, woman life, the um, incoherences of humanity. This is for one part. And the other, I think, what we can use to think about today's present and today's dynamics worldwide is the dangers of totalitarianism of any kind. You cannot impose things to others. You cannot rule with one single view and with a view that will destroy minorities and destroy the marvelous diversity of humanity. So you have to respect differences. Uh, and I think this we can bear in mind when we are talking about uh, this kind of institutions that ultimately try to uniformize the society. Uh, so I will say that we have to bear these questions in mind when we address these kind of topics. Thank you so much, Susanna. It was wonderful. And I want to tell our viewers that if you want to know more about this trial, and get a little glimpse of what the trial was during the Inquisition. It may not be the same for every case, but at least you get a rough idea of what it is. You should surely go and, sorry, you should surely go and purchase this book, The Trial of Katarina the Orta by Goa Inquisition. You, it is available at Dogius, Margao. Yeah, and once you read through it, you will understand how complex this institution was very fearful and yet sometimes a lot of times merciful as well for a lot of people. Susanna, thank you so much. It was an honor interviewing you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much.